would appear the longest standing former president of the Criminal Lawyers Association. I don't imagine that anybody will top that record, certainly in, at the present time when lawyers are much more critical of the governing bodies. I guess th what you'd have to do is get the government to double legal aid, and that might do it. In any event, uh, uh, Earl Levy, who's one of the best cross-examiners in the business, will talk about preparing to cross-examine an expert. Earl. Thank you. <clears throat> A number of, of years ago, three accused by the family name of Math were charged with the murder of a woman in what the media referred to as the torso murder trial because only the deceased torso was found uh, as well as an arm and a leg but not the head and it was the Crown's theory that the deceased was manually strangled to death. The prosecution called a very experienced and respected pathologist from Toronto to testify categorically that the deceased had been manually strangled and pointed to a certain markings in the neck area to prove that point. The pathologist was adamant that the deceased had been manually strangled. Dave Humphrey QC, now Mr. Justice Humphrey of the, uh, our general division, represented Harbajan Math, um, the man the Crown alleged did the killing. Harbajan Math denied strangling the deceased and claimed she must have fallen down the stairs and killed herself. Uh, I represented his brother who was alleged to have helped in the killing along with his wife. After the Crown finished putting in its case, Dave Humphrey called me over just before he was to make his opening to the jury. He wanted his client to repeat to me what he had just told David. Harbajan Math asked whether it would help his case if they found the head. <laughs> We told them he had nothing to lose by telling where the head was located given the evidence against him. The head might reveal a clue as to how the deceased met her death if not the way the prosecution had alleged. Dave Humphrey opened to the jury <clears throat> when it was time to call the defense, uh, telling it that we were going to adjourn for the day because his client was going to take the police to where the head was located. Uh, this was rather a different defense opening than is normally heard. <laughs> the trial was approximately a year after death, and I must confess I ne never really thought they would find the head, and if they did, it would be only a skeleton revealing little or nothing. <clears throat> I was more than glad that I refused an invitation to join the search party that night. Uh, the next morning upon entering the courtroom, I was confronted with a stack of photographs on uh, my desk depicting the head of the deceased almost perfectly preserved. We soon, soon learned that the head had been preserved because after Harbajan Math cut it off, he had thrown it into a vat of oil and then placed it into a bag which was thrown into a river which subsequently froze. All of this kept the head mostly intact. And he had cut the body up because after the woman had died, Rigor mortis set in, she stiffened up, and he could not fit her into his Volkswagen when he attempted to dispose of the body. <laughs> Lo and behold, it was discovered that the jaw had been broken in two places. <clears throat> the tongue, as we learned from further expert testimony, was set loose as a result of these breaks, and the victim choked to death on her tongue. The deceased had not been manually strangled as the expert so confidently testified. And I must tell you though that in the final analysis this revelation did not help Harbajan Math. He was convicted of murder, but no thanks to the expert. <laughs> now why am I telling you this story other than it is interesting and <laughs> obviously takes up time? Um, it shows you that no matter what the credentials of the expert may be, he or she can be wrong, and you as counsel should not be overawed <laughs> by the expert. 
While it is true that experts usually know a great deal more about the subject matter that they testify to than you, they are only human and they are testifying in your arena and subject to your advocacy skills. Proper preparation can ease your discomfort in cross-examining the expert. <clears throat> While it was perhaps only luck that impeached the pathologist in the math case, solid preparation for cross-examination of the expert, just like any important witness, may produce dividends. There is no need to be so worried about the expert that you choose only to dance around this type of witness, afraid to do no more than stick your tongue out here and there because you are fearful of a head-on attack. Hopefully over the rest of the lecture, uh, this lecture I can convince you of this. Now, I have to tell you, I was hoping when I looked out <laughs> to the body of the uh, registrants, I'd see mostly a, um, a, a criminal law bar here, but uh, I don't. So I, I, but I do feel that what I'm about to say you can adapt to the, to the civil context. Your purpose in cross-examining the expert is to obtain answers which will support your defense and or neutralize or discredit incriminating evidence presented by the Crown. This may even include discrediting the expert witness. A thorough understanding of the subject matter is obviously required. This often means retaining your own expert to educate you and assist you in preparing your cross-examination. Your expert can refer you to authoritative texts and articles which you can read and from which you can cross-examine your opponent's experts. Often writings authored by your opponent's expert can potentially be used for impeachment purposes. Your expert may be able to provide you with information about your opponent's expert which you may be able to use in cross-examination, such as the way the expert responds to cross-examination, whether the expert has taken different positions on other occasions and any other potential vulnerabilities of the witness. You, of course, have to assist your expert, providing him or her with relevant statements, transcripts of the preliminary hearing, uh, reports, photographs, and access to the client when necessary. Exhibits filed at the preliminary hearing can be inspected by your expert, normally at, uh, for example, here at the General Division Clerk's Office. The criminal code provides for a court order to be obtained where you wish to have an exhibit tested by your experts. If the Crown Disclosure has not provided a copy of the experts' notes, write for disclosure of them. At the very least, ask to see the experts' notes when he or she is on the witness stand, for they may reveal valuable information which you do not have. What some counsel fail to realize, at least in the criminal context, is that you can often go directly to the Crown's expert to be educated. If you do, you may even be fortunate enough to receive information which will assist you in your cross-examination to the extent that you can save the expense of retaining your own expert. Often Crown experts are from the Center of Forensic Sciences. I have found without exception that these experts from the Center will sit down and freely discuss their findings and answer your questions. Now this may be because they are employed by a government facility supported by taxpayers' money. Also pathologists and police identification officers are normally as cooperative. If an opposing expert refuses to talk to you, notwithstanding that there is no property in a witness, bring this fact out in cross-examination to show the witness's possible partisanship. If you, do speak, if you do speak to the opposing expert, it would be best to have a witness with you, such as a student taking notes, to guard against any possible allegations involving witness tampering or if the expert says something different on the witness stand than in, in your interview. If such were to occur, your witness will be able to testify on your behalf, lessening the necessity of you retiring from the case and becoming a witness. If you have retained an expert, ask the judge to, to exclude him or her from the order excluding witnesses so that your expert can hear the relevant testimony. This may be helpful in the formulation of your expert's opinion or in commenting on the opinion of the opposing expert, as well as advising you of additional lines of inquiry on cross-examination. At the very least, with your expert in the courtroom at counsel table, your opponent's expert will be careful not to make any exaggerated, rash, or untrue statements. The preliminary hearing is a very useful procedure in preparing to cross-examine the expert at trial. It is not common in my experience 
for the Crown to call its expert witnesses at the preliminary hearing. The, the reasons are that normally the expert is not required to obtain a, a committal. The expert is too busy with other matters and the expense can be saved. I would suggest that in most cases you request the Crown to have its expert at the preliminary hearing advising the Crown that you will call the expert if the Crown does not subpoena the expert or the Crown will not make the expert available. Now the reason I say it is important to have the expert testify at the preliminary hearing is that their testimony can be crucial at trial. Their reports often do not tell the whole story that will emerge through the Crown's questions in chief at trial and your cross-examination. Their testimony under oath reflected in the transcript of the preliminary hearing will be helpful to your own expert and in your preparation for cross-examination at trial. By testing the expert's credentials at the preliminary hearing, you can decide whether or not you wish to challenge his or her expert uh, come the trial. You will ask the expert what writings they consider authoritative on the subject or what specifically he or she has written on the topic. Between the time of the preliminary hearing and the trial, you can read those texts or papers to ascertain if, if there is anything there for impeachment purposes or to support your case at the, at the trial stage. The rule is repeated in Regina versus Markhart is that counsel cannot cross-examine the expert on a text unless he or she admits familiarity with the text and considers it authoritative. If the witness acknowledges the authority of the work, then counsel can read from it, and to the extent the parts read are confirmed, they become evidence. If the expert does not admit to knowing about the text, it may affect the weight of his or her opinion in the eyes of the jurors, especially if the witness keeps refusing to admit knowledge of other writings brought to his or her attention. The cross-examiner, of course, could have his or her own expert testify that any knowledgeable person in the field would be familiar with the writings on which the opponent's expert has been cross-examined. Inquire of the expert at the preliminary hearing what other experts in the field have the witnesses respect and if there are any experts who may even be more qualified than the witness. You may wish to retain one of those experts for trial. I would also suggest that you inquire about a potential for the expert's bias at the preliminary hearing stage, such as payment for services and how often the expert has testified for either side. This trial run may influence your decision whether or not you pursue the matter at trial. And I'll speak more about this later. At the preliminary hearing stage, you can ascertain the thoroughness and completeness of the expert's interviews or testing procedures, potentially laying the groundwork for fruitful cross-examination at trial, particular, particularly if your opponent's expert has not been as thorough as your own in coming to his or her conclusions. You want to be careful, however, not to show at the preliminary hearing stage that the opponent's expert did not do all he or she should have done in reaching a conclusion because the witness may rectify um, his or her omissions or mistakes before the trial. At the very least, you will learn from the preliminary hearing stage what questions not to ask at trial or what future investigations and preparations you should do for trial. At the preliminary hearing stage, you can afford to take some chances with your questions that you would not want to take at trial, hoping that something can be gained. In the last analysis, in order to be pre <coughs> prepared for your cross-examination of the expert at trial, a thorough examination should take place at the preliminary hearing. Use this procedure as a testing ground to determine the reliability of your opponent's case, to define more clearly the issues, to obtain discovery of evidence not already known, and to tie the experts to their answers so that if they change those answers at trial, you can impeach them with the transcript of their evidence. Prepare to deal with the qualification of your opponent's expert. When an expert is called to give an opinion, counsel must first establish that witness's expertise to give such an opinion, and you've heard uh, a fair amount about that earlier. Opposing counsel may cross-examine on that issue before the witness is qualified by the judge. It would be a rare occasion, indeed, when you would be able to show that an expert is not qualified to give his or her opinion. If you are satisfied that this is the case, save any cross-examination going to the expert's qualification until you cross-examine at large. You may even wish to admit to the expert's qualifications at the outset in the hope that your opponent will not go into full detail of those credentials. Opposing counsel, if wise, will thank you but continue to bring out the witness's credentials 
not only to make the witness's <coughs> conclusions sound more impressive to the trier of fact, but to make a record for the Court of Appeal if, if needed. Object if your opponent wishes to file his or her expert's qualifications in a jury trial, particularly if they are better than your experts, um, or you do not have an expert. The trial judge would not, in my experience, permit an expert's CV to be filed because to do so would give added weight to that evidence as the jury would be able to read it in the, uh, in the jury room, giving it more weight than the, uh, than the oral testimony. Uh, <clears throat> there would not be such a problem where the trial was before a judge alone because the trial judge would be making notes of the expert's qualifications in any event. Uh, no, and no doubt the, uh, the trial judge would appreciate the saving of, the, of energy writing out the witness's CV it would, if it was to be filed as an exhibit. In preparing to cross-examine the expert on his or her qualifications, you should be thinking about isolating those parts of the expert's qualifications which turn, turn out to be irrelevant. For example, if the expert testified to an impressive list of irrelevant writings, ask how those authorships help the witness come to his or her conclusions. If the witness's expertise is based more on his or her academic credentials than practical experience, you will want that brought home to the jury. You may have the opportunity to compare directly the expert's qualifications with your own experts. Your expert can help you here, as for example, by identifying various medical societies that your opponent's expert belongs to only require an application to join whilst your expert is a member of certain medical groups in which membership must be earned by special training. Where possible, use the opponent's expert to trumpet the expertise of your own expert. If the former knows anything about your expert's qualifications, he or she will no doubt agree that your expert is well qualified in the area and may, where the facts warrant, agree that your expert is even more qualified than the witness. It would be uh, a delicious thing if you could put to your opponent's expert that there are a number of experts in the field that have more knowledge about the topic than he or she and name your expert as, uh, as one of them. Prepare to inquire about any possible bias of your opponent's expert. It would obviously be helpful if you could show that your opponent's expert has a bias. As indicated earlier, the best place to begin asking these questions is at the preliminary hearing to determine if the matter is worth pursuing at the, at the trial stage. An obvious line of inquiry is whether the expert is being paid for his or her services, and if so, how much. <clears throat> no doubt the jury will expect the expert to be paid uh, for his or her services, but if the amount is excessive, the jury may feel it was purchased testimony influenced uh, by the amount of the fee. Uh, this approach is not helpful, however, if you're paying for your own expert. Uh, if the expert comes from out of the country to testify at great expense, you may wish to inquire about this fact, wondering why an expert could not be found in this jurisdiction. Was it because your opponent could not find anyone in this jurisdiction to support his or her position? You may also wish to inquire how often the expert has testified for the prosecution or defense. If the expert has predominantly testified for one side only, he or she may be shown to have a bias. Often the Crown's experts come from the Center of Forensic Sciences and Criminal Matters. These experts are not paid for their services, and when they give their evidence, they generally appear to be impartial. However, if you feel it is relevant to your situation, you may wish to point out for the jury that the expert from the Center of Forensic Sciences is employed by the Solicitor General, who is also the minister responsible for policing in the province, and that the Center of Forensic Sciences works closely with the police and the prosecution in homicides and other types of cases. However, the Crown may counter this tactic by eliciting from the witness that defense lawyers are entitled to use the center's services free of charge for their clients. You might also bring forth when the facts warrant that when the expert met with the police, they gave the expert their opinions or theories as to what happened, and they did so before the expert announced his or her opinion, that the police theories influenced the opinion of the expert. As so often is the case with witnesses whose credibility you are challenging, they can also provide helpful testimony, um, or you are hopeful they can. Mind them for the good stuff before you attack them. Uh, they should be in a better mood to be helpful at that point in your cross-examination. 
prepare to attack the thoroughness of the expert's work. It is not unusual for an expert to give his or her opinion even when it is not based on first-hand knowledge. This is particularly so when the witness's answer is in response to a hypothetical question. In this situation, counsel should obtain a witness's admission that it is always more advantageous to interview the witness uh, himself or herself in order to have first-hand knowledge. An attack on the expert's opinion can be made when the expert gave an opinion, albeit he or she did not have all the relevant facts. Examples include situations where the expert did not perform all of the tests he or she could have. His or her examinations were, for any number of reasons, not as complete as they would have liked. The expert did not speak to all the people to whom he or she should have spoken to in order to obtain background information about the accused or the offense. Or where the expert did not speak to the accused when such an interview may have been helpful in forming an opinion, although counsel should be cautious here if the accused refused permission to be so interviewed as this fact would be brought out by the Crown. Where possible, counsel should contrast the thoroughness of the opposing expert in arriving at a reliable opinion with that of his or, own ex his or her own expert, as for example, where there is an issue of insanity and the counsel's expert has spent considerably more time interviewing the client than the Crown psychiatrist who has spent a relatively short period of time with the client. The cross-examiner should make the point that his or her expert had every opportunity to know the accused better than his or her opponent's expert and therefore the cross-examiner's um, expert's opinion or conclusion is based on a more solid foundation and is therefore more accurate. Prepare to attack the reliability of the expert's interviews. There are some experts such as psychiatrists and psychologists who by the very nature of their work interview patients or clients who may not have been fully truthful or reliable in what they reported to the expert either because of their mental instability or because of their vested interest in the outcome of the matter. The cross-examiner, often the Crown Attorney in such cases, should point out the unreliability of such interviews or at least make the point that the expert's opinion is based on the truthfulness and reliability of what he or she was told and that if the patient or client was untruthful, the expert's opinion would uh, change. I am a believer <coughs> in the tri... Uh, in the trier of fact, whether it be the judge alone or a jury, being made aware of the defense's position as soon as possible during um, your case, or during the Crown's case, excuse me. I do not want my opponent's case standing alone, entrenched in the minds of the trier of fact, without my client's side of the story being thought about until I call a defense, by which time it may be too late. The way to do this is to put your case to the Crown's witnesses in cross-examination when the opportunity presents itself. Repeating your client's position as often as possible can only help unless it is, of course, a weak position. Now, there are different ways to put your case in cross-examination, and the preparation of your questions is most important here. With the expert, the opportunity can present itself by way of the hypothetical question the device the law has developed to permit an expert to give his or her opinion based on a hypothetical question containing facts of which the expert is not aware firsthand or which are not the subject of, of a consensus by both sides. For the opinion to contain any validity, the hypothetical facts referred to have to eventually appear somewhere in the evidence, I would think. And you on cross-examination should be prepared to repeat the hypothetical but include those different facts upon which you rely and attempt to lead the expert into giving a conclusion favorable to your client. Outside the hypothetical, there is nothing to prevent you from putting your case to the expert as, for example, inviting the witness to agree with the propositions and methods which form the basis of your expert's opinion. If there are versions in the evidence which are different from, the, from what the expert received, from his or her side, they should be brought to the witness's attention. He or she should then be asked if uh, his or her opinion would change in light of, of this other version, and if so, try and lead the expert to a conclusion favorable to your side. It goes without saying that it would be helpful to lead the expert to admitting that there is another possibility or even probability that he or she cannot exclude or say is wrong. In preparing for your cross-examination, perhaps with help 
from your own expert, you may be able to put forth another explanation from the same set of facts which will neutralize or even change the opinion of the expert. At the very least, obtain from the witness the admission that in his or her field of expertise, legitimate differences of opinion occur between qualified experts in order to leave the impression that the witness's opinion is just that, an opinion not carved in stone. Experts are usually experienced witnesses who have been cross-examined many times by experienced counsel. They probably know many of the questions you will ask before you even ask them. They are very comfortable in the witness box and most often have an air of credibility. It is important that you not depart from one of the golden rules of cross-examination, controlling the witness. If you lose control of the expert, allowing the witness to go where he or she wants to go and not where you want the witness to go, you may find yourself in rough waters you may never get out of. When preparing to cross-examine the expert, prepare leading questions. Don't ask open-ended questions. If it becomes necessary to coax or impeach the witness, you will have at the ready properly referenced the expert's report and his or her evidence at the preliminary hearing, relevant photographs, uh, and any other material that uh, is helpful. In preparing your cross-examination of the expert, be mindful of the rules of evidence which relate to the admissibility of expert testimony, particularly given the conditions precedent for admissibility set out by the Supreme Court of Canada in uh, Regina versus Mohan. Um, which has already been discussed. If you have any doubts about the admissibility of such evidence, and I would suggest you request a voir dire in the issue, as for example, where you have an expert advancing a novel scientific theory or technique, and your position is that the theory or technique has not attracted uh, wide uh, spread acceptance within the relevant scientific community. Such evidence may not be admissible as a result of Mohan. Uh, your preparation for cross-examination should therefore be geared toward the voir dire, which would not necessarily be the same as your cross-examination before the, before the jury. However, even if you're unsuccessful in keeping the evidence out, you may wish to repeat the cross-examination on the issue before the jury if the weight of the evidence is a factor. The opportunity you had to cross-examine the witness on the voir dire will no doubt influence you in how to approach the expert in cross-examination before the jury. <clears throat> uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, that, that concludes my remarks, uh, except to uh, hearken back to the torso case I referred to at the, uh, at the outset. It reminds me of those famous words from the poem, If, penned by Rudyard Kipling. Um, <laughs> The quote: if, "If you can keep your, <laughs> if you can keep your head, when all amongst you are losing theirs, etc., etc." A rather helpful thought when cross-examining the expert. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Levy. The next speaker is uh, Professor Alan Mewitt, QC, a professor at the Law School, of the University of Toronto and the unofficial Dean of Evidence Professors in Canada. I have to be restrained in the glowing introduction that I would otherwise give him, mindful of the fact that he's one of my competitors, being also an author on the laws of evidence. But notwithstanding my best efforts, I have to say he's often cited by our court as an expert on evidence, and we have therefore given him a very difficult topic and a very important one exploring the basis of an expert's opinion and examining the methods used, weight or admissibility. Professor Buick. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to spend my half hour sort of going through uh, some of the points I make in this paper. Um, not necessarily in the order I make them, but I've made them, but uh, hoping to clear up one or two things. Um, first of all, if I can start with a perfectly obvious basic point, um, it is that it, it, whenever you call an expert, it's the opinion of the expert which is in evidence. That's the evidence before the jury, not 
the basis on which that expert reaches his opinion. But for the opinion to be admissible, of course, it has to be based on facts which are proven in evidence, and those facts, of course, will have to be relevant to an issue or within the, uh, within the limits are relevant to the credibility of a witness. So uh, the result of that is that if there is no admissible factual basis for the opinion, then the opinion itself is irrelevant, and the opinion itself is inadmissible. Some jurisdictions, uh, England for example, require that the factual basis for an opinion be proven first before the opinion evidence becomes admissible. Other uh, jurisdictions are slightly less draconian and only require that there is a stipulation that those uh, basic facts will be proved. Uh, Canada, uh, I think, uh, hasn't adopted either of those uh, positions. The position in Canada seems to be that the opinion evidence is admissible at the beginning, initially, whether or not those facts have been proved and whether or not those basic facts will be proved. But if at the end of the case there is no evidence to support those basic facts, then the opinion will be entitled to no weight. I share Mr. Justice Sapinka's view that uh, conceptually that's very difficult to accept. Uh, you can't, it seems to me, have a situation where evidence is admissible but entitled to no weight because if it's entitled to no weight because it's irrelevant then it must be inadmissible. Uh, I think myself though it hasn't been articulated uh, in the Supreme Court, that really our rule is that opinion evidence is conditionally admissible. It's conditionally admissible, and the condition is that at the end of the case, there are facts proved which will make that uh, opinion evidence relevant. If at the end of the case there are no facts to support that opinion, then it is retroactively, if you like, inadmissible. Uh, if there are facts which support it, then whether the jury finds those facts or not uh, will control how they use the opinion evidence. I don't think there's anything novel about that. There are other areas of law where we have this concept of conditional admissibility. We do it, for example, uh, in the case of the so-called co-conspirators exception to the hearsay rule, where uh, 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 statements made by one uh, conspirator are admissible against the other conspirator, but only if the jury finds that there is evidence which would support a conspiracy in the first place. If there isn't, then those statements retroactively become inadmissible against that co-conspirator. So I think uh, whatever language is used, what we're really saying is uh, opinion evidence is conditionally admissible upon facts being proved which support uh, uh, that, um, that uh, uh, opinion. Well, this gives rise to the first question, and that is, well, what has to be proved as a basis for the, that opinion? I think the answer is that it's the basis for the opinion that has to be proved, not the basis for the expertise. And unfortunately, I think some of our courts get these two concepts uh, mixed up. I'm not sure whether it's, it's helpful, but the English use uh, the expression primary facts and secondary facts. Primary facts are those facts which have to be proved in evidence upon which the expert brings his expertise to bear. Secondary facts are those facts that go to make up his expertise, 
what makes him an expert are secondary facts, not primary facts. Uh, now, there's a good illustration of that. It's a, uh, the English case of Abaddon, which I mentioned on page uh, six. Uh, it's fortunate, it's a fairly straightforward and, and an easy case. Uh, the accused is charged with uh, uh, breaking and entering a, a, stop, uh, a shop uh, storefront. And some glass fragments were found in his uh, trouser uh, pant leg. And the question was whether those glass fragments came from the shop uh, window, the smash shop window. The Crown called an expert in glass, whatever they're called, um, to testify that in his opinion those uh, fragments probably came from uh, the shop window. And he explained about the uh, experiments he's conducted and the analysis of the uh, refraction of the glass and so on, and concluded that in all probability it came from the shop window. <coughs> Why do you conclude that, asked the crowd? Well, says the expert, because only 4% of the glass manufactured in England have, has that particular refractive index. Therefore, it's overwhelmingly probable that uh, the glass fragments came from the window. Okay, how do you know that only 4% of the glass manufactured in England has that, has that particular uh, refractive index? Oh well, says the expert, the Home Office sends out a circular uh, twice a year in which they uh, set out tables of glass refraction uh, indices and so on, uh, and the amount of glass manufactured. Whereupon the defense immediately objected and said, but it hasn't been proved in evidence that only 4% of the glass manufactured in England has this particular refractive index. Therefore, it's hearsay. Therefore, it's inadmissible, because there's no basis for the finding. Well, the, the, the problem resolves, uh, revolves around the question about whether that table was what is called primary facts. That is, are those facts upon which the expert bases his opinion? Or are they secondary facts? That is, facts which form part of the overall expertise of an expert. And the English Court of Appeal, and I think quite rightly, though, uh, you know, it's a touch-and-go case, but I think they were right to say, no, this is part of his expertise. This is what makes an expert an expert. He reads things sent out by the Home Office, he talks to people, he has coffee with people, and so on. That's all what makes an expert an expert. <laughs> Therefore, those things don't have to be proved. It's not part of the basic facts upon which the guy brought his expertise to bear. It's part of his, the expertise itself. Therefore, it's admissible. Therefore, it doesn't have to be proved. And as I say, I think uh, that's fair enough. Uh, it, it leads to a problem which we haven't really had much discussion about in Canada yet. Uh, and that is the use of technicians. Um, you know, I very much doubt if many, I don't know, pathologists or somebody, you know, actually cut up the dead body. Uh, much more likely, uh, somebody else does it, a technician, and sends a report to the expert. And relying on that report, the expert then gives his opinion. Well, you know, one can argue, of course, that that is inadmissible hearsay. That is, that if an expert relies upon information provided to him, that is, on data, which somebody else gives him, then that expert is relying on facts which are not admissible. It's, an, it's going to be an increasing field because more and more, of course, we're using computers, more and more we're using uh, technicians, diagnosticians. They provide information to the expert, and the expert then formulates his opinion. Do those 
facts have to be proved. In other words, do you have to call the technician to say he was the one that removed the liver or the spleen or whatever it is and handed it over? Do you have to call the actual technician who performed the blood test and so on, rather than the so-called expert who then analyzes the results of the technician's work? Well, uh, I think those are part of primary facts. I think they have to be proved. They should be proved. Um, but I think, uh, I mean, I'm not sure. I, I say this with some hesitation. But I think in Canada, uh, the problem is resolved because I think those technicians' reports or computers' reports or, or whatever you might call them are admissible as uh, admissible hearsay evidence. I mean, I think to me they're either under the, you know, the business records uh, exception uh, under either the Canada Evidence Act or the Ontario Evidence Act, or I think under the expanded hearsay, you know, the Kahn-Smith uh, 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 type of situation. So, uh, I mean, one of these days, uh, people are going to object to the admission of these, but I think there is an answer. And the answer is, well, yes, uh, it is hearsay, but it's admissible hearsay and is therefore um, uh, 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 admissible. Second point that arises from this is that the factual basis for the opinion is not only admissible uh, going to whether the opinion is admitted or uh, admissible or not, but it's also admissible to go to, cr to the weight which you give the opinion of the expert. And when, as you frequently have, you have two conflicting experts, of course, it really is going to come down to which of those the jury believes, if they believe either of them. And a jury is, of course, always free to, to reject both of them. Uh, balancing, you know, the relative weights of expert opinion uh, is frequently done rather nonsensically by uh, a fight between credentials. You know, my, my, my guy's got a PhD from Heidelberg or somewhere, and somebody else only has a PhD from York or one of those places. And that, that sort of thing. Um, since Wildband, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada case of Wildband, which is on the first page there, it is perfectly clear, I think, that you can also uh, ask the expert on, uh, as to the basis on which he reaches his opinion. And to me, it makes much more sense. It gives the jury, I think, much more uh, to go on if they can also take into account how it was he reached his opinion and, uh, and so on. If that um, uh, a, a basis on which he reached his opinion is unproven, then at the end of the case, I think the result is the opinion is inadmissible. If it's proven and accepted by the jury, fine. The Supreme Court of Canada case of Lavallee raises the interesting question of, well, what happens, as is frequently the case, an expert's opinion is based partly on proven evidence, that is, facts before the jury, and partly on unproven evidence, that is, facts which are not before the jury. Does this render the opinions expert inadmissible? I think the result in Lavallee is quite right, though uh, uh, it's not without its difficulty, but uh, Lavallee says, well, that goes to weight rather than admissibility. That is, if you can say to the jury, yes, it's in La Vallée itself, I might say, uh, uh, precisely that situation arose. Be uh, La Vallée is the c uh, case of the so-called battered wife uh, syndrome and so on. And Mrs. La Vallée herself didn't testify, but uh, there was an expert testifying as to the mechanics uh, of, uh, of uh, the battered wife syndrome. Part of that was based on evidence which was before the jury. Part of it was based on inadmissible hearsay evidence and so on. Okay, uh, says Madam Justice Wilson, that doesn't render it inadmissible. But it's something that goes to weight. Um, I'm 
I, I mean, I accept that, but I'm not quite sure how in practice it's going to work. Um, are you allowed to cross-examine the expert, for example, to say, well, doctor, would your opinion have been the same if you had based it only on facts A, B, and C? That is, those facts which are admissible in evidence. Or would, the, would your opinion be different if you hadn't had available to, to you these other facts? If a mixture of inadmissible and admissible bases does go to weight, then it seems to me there must be some way of exploring how it goes to weight. That is, would it in fact make a difference? If the answer is yes, then I think the jury is entitled to, to, uh, to know that. So the, the, the problem which I see from Lavallee is not the principle, but how you put it into effect in practice. The difficulty which one is confronted with is there is uh, what uh, I must say, in my opinion, is a wrong decision of the Supreme Court. Uh, Mr. Justice uh, Sibing had nothing whatever to do with it, so it's no criticism of him. Uh, a case called Howard, uh, where I think the, uh, it's, it's on page nine of, uh, of my paper. Um, I think, myself, the Supreme Court was confused about whether what you were doing was attacking the primary facts, that is, attacking the facts upon which the expert based his opinion, or whether they were attacking his expertise. Howard uh, and a co-accused were charged with uh, an offense, uh, a robbery offense. And the major evidence against both of them were some footprints that had been found at the scene of the crime. The Crown called an expert in footprints, again, I don't know what they're called, but I mean, presumably, you know, some expert, who testified that those footprints belonged to uh, Howard and the co-accused. The defense called their expert in footprints who testified that, in his opinion, those footprints did not belong to Howard or to the co-accused. It goes to the jury. They convict. Uh, they appeal to the Court of Appeal on different grounds, and a new trial was ordered. Before the new trial, Howard's co-accused confessed uh, to the crime and admitted that his footprints, uh, the, 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 footprints the, fo the footprints were in fact his. Howard didn't. So the second trial proceeds only against Howard. Well, the same evidence is called. But before Howard's defense counsel called his footprint evidence, his footprint expert the second time, Crown counsel asked for a ruling. And the, what, the, what really, he, he asked the trial judge whether he would be allowed to cross-examine the defense uh, expert on denying that the footprints were Howard's as to whether his opinion would be the same if he'd known that Howard's co-accused had confessed to the crime. Of course, says the trial judge, why ever not? Whereupon Howard's defense counsel, I think quite rightly, decided not to call his expert after all. Uh, Howard's convicted. It now goes to the Supreme Court, eventually goes to the Supreme Court. And the question is whether or not uh, Crown counsel would be entitled to cross-examine the expert witness as to whether his opinion would have been the same had he known that Howard's co-accused had admitted that the footprints were his. The majority of the Supreme Court say certainly not. That is inadmissible. And their, the basis for their opinion is that whether or not a co-accused had 
admitted guilt and had confessed and pleaded guilty, whether or not he pleaded guilty would not, was not, and never would be an issue in Howard's trial. Therefore, says the majority, it is irrelevant and therefore inadmissible. I personally think that's an affront to common sense. The mistake I think that the Supreme Court made, the majority of the Supreme Court, uh, with respect, made, was in assuming that the fact that a co-accused had confessed was a primary fact. That is, was it part of the experts bringing his expertise to bear on these facts? Madam Justice Leroux Dubé dissented Madam Justice Loro Dubé dissented and said, I can't think of anything more relevant than asking an expert who is there testifying that he, in his opinion, these footprints were not Howard's, and by extension, nor the co-accused, and not being able to be cross-examined on whether that would be the same if he'd known that the co-accused had admitted that they were his footprints. To be honest, I think Madam Justice Laura Dubé is right uh, in, in, in that case. Um, uh, what you're trying to do is not attack the basis, that is the factual basis. What you're trying to do is say, this isn't much of an expert. In other words, you're attacking his expertise. And you're attacking whether the methodology he, 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 he adopted and, and, and so on uh, really worked. Secondary facts don't have to be proved. That is, they're not part of the facts in issue. They're a method of attacking weight or, if you like, attacking credibility. Um, any reference in a case like Howard to whether these hypothetical facts would ever become a fact in issue, seems to me to miss the point entirely. The point, and I, I might say, uh, uh, in the Court of Appeal, uh, Mr. Justice Corey had uh, uh, written a judgment with which uh, Madam Justice Leroux Dubé uh, agreed, so perhaps the balance of power shift is shifted now anyway, so Howard may not represent the law. But it seems to me an example of confusing primary facts with secondary facts. That is, are you attacking the admissibility of this opinion, or are you merely uh, 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 attacking the weight or the expertise of the expert? The next thing I'd, I'd like to say a, a little bit about, I'm, am I running out of time? I'm not sure I am. No, you've got two minutes. Uh, oh, well, then, <laughs> five? Um, uh, use of these hypothetical questions, um, uh, I think much too much has been said about it, um, really. Uh, hypothetical questions are awkward, and they very often confuse uh, the expert anyway. Uh, I think... Uh, I think it's true that there is a requirement of of questions being phrased hypothetically. If, but only if, uh, and there's a case uh, later in the Supreme Court, if and only if uh, those facts are in dispute. If they're not in dispute or not reasonably in dispute, there's no, I don't think, any necessity to phrase it hypothetically at all. Uh, it's unnecessary. Um, uh, in the cases where it's said to be necessary, I think the danger lies uh, in misleading the jury into thinking that facts have been proved when they haven't been proved. In other words, it's, it's really an attempt to hoodwink the jury. In other words, using a hypothetical uh, way of phrasing questions seems to me to be sound practice more than anything else. Because if you don't phrase it hypothetically, the trial judge is going to say to the jury in uh, the summing up, now remember, members of the jury, those facts have not been found. And I think you're probably worse off uh, than if you hadn't tried to hoodwink the jury uh, anyway. Uh, 
Uh, there is, uh, on page uh, 15, I said I had an, an interesting case of PC, um, where the hypothetical went on for about a page and a half. Uh, and at the end of it, uh, I think the expert replied yes, or something like that. <laughs> um, I think the lesson to be learned from it really is if, you're, if you are using hypothetical questions, I mean, keep them short, keep them simple, uh, don't confuse the jury, uh, don't try to slip one over the jury, and above all, I think, don't try to, uh, to um, uh, 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 hoodwink uh, the jury. Um, another point I was going to mention, but, but Earl has uh, mentioned it, is uh, this, I think, regrettable tendency to try to one-up an expert by confronting him with other learned treatises that you or, or your article in Clark has found uh, uh, in which you think there's a contrary opinion. Uh, and I think Marcard uh, is well worth reading for that on how far you can go uh, uh, along those lines. Let me just make one last point, if I may, may as a uh, caution, uh, perhaps to uh, Mr. Justice Sapink, I'm not sure. Um, don't lose sight of the relevance of expert opinion. Uh, on page nine, I, 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 I refer to a case called uh, BG. Uh, the question was whether the complainant had been sexually assaulted. The Crown calls an expert in, in child psychology, and the Crown testifies that uh, BG, uh, the, the victim, uh, had been suffering from uh, nightmares and bedwetting. He then said, he's uh, you know, interviewed a lot of these kids and so on, and bedwetting and nightmares uh, is a sign that the kid might have been sexually assaulted. Okay, says Madam Justice Wilson, that is some evidence that a sexual assault took place. It is absolutely nothing of the kind. It is a gross illogicality. And I'm surprised that the Supreme Court uh, would have accepted it. That sort of evidence is of no relevance at all unless the expert can say only Kids who have been sexually assaulted suffer from bedwetting and nightmares. If the evidence is that some kids who suffer from bedwetting and nightmares suffer sexual assault, that, which it was, it proves absolutely nothing except that the kid could have been sexually assaulted, but equally as well, he might not have been sexually assaulted. In other words, it proves nothing at all. There is a tendency, I think, to uh, forget the logic that you have to apply to these sorts of cases. There's this undue regard, I think, a worship for the infallibility of this sort of expert evidence. It leads to danger, and I think it has to be avoided. All right, thank you. I'm sorry, went over. Well, thank you very much, Professor Mewitt, uh, for that very informative talk on a very difficult subject, which has not as yet been settled. And I certainly will take back to my colleagues your message about Howard. <coughs> and, uh, and also that we can sometimes now recognize an expert on the amount of coffee that has been drunk. Now, uh, we will now have our panel. I wonder if the panelists would come up, and we'll get started on the panel.